The Shadows of Titan by Carter Reed and Brad R. Torgerson The sky was dim, dimmer even than the Puget Sounds on a rainy winter day, and there were no clouds, just a persistent, dirty yellow haze, as if the smog over Mexico City had thickened and dropped to ground level only I was reasonably certain it had never drizzled liquid methane in Mexico's federal district. The Celsius reading in my helmet's field of view display said it was a crisp 179 degrees below zero. I could faintly hear the susurrations of my cold suit circulation system as it piped reheated antifreeze throughout. The battery had been rated at 12 hours during cold suit testing in Antarctica, where things only got to about 80 below. Judging by how rapidly the charge bar in my FOV was presently dropping, I guessed we each had about four hours before we had to get back to the Gossamers to send module for a battery swap. And a break, which was fine by me. Titan kind of gave me the creeps. What do you make of it? Asked a voice in my ears. Captain Bedner. Playing it cool? No idea. Ma'am. I said honestly. Clad in a cold suit built for a woman's physique. Bedner's arm was pointing at the four-story tall pyramid that thrust out of the heaped ice of Titan's surface. We'd seen the artifact on accident as we'd come into land. It didn't show up on Doppler or infrared, and it had been too small to be seen from orbit. A chance look out a porthole had done the trick. It had taken us ten minutes in a rover to get here from the designated landing coordinates. That the pyramid was not a natural landform had long since become obvious. Its sides were smooth and black like obsidian and the drops of methane that precipitated out of the nitrogen atmosphere immediately ran down the pyramid's sides like it was coated in non-stick Teflon. But who had put the pyramid here? And why? And for what purpose? Were complete mysteries. Captain Bedner's arm slowly dropped to her side. I looked at her as she continued looking at the artifact. The expression on her face, as seen through her helmet's clear face shield, was almost greedy with anticipation. I felt a twinge. Technically, she was a mutineer. According to the mission plan established years before leaving Earth, Bedner was supposed to have remained in Titan orbit with our two crew who were manning the Gossamer's nuclear rocket-powered return module. Instead, she'd handily ripped that page out of the plan upon our having entered Saturn's space and there'd been precious little any of us could say otherwise. After all, what was mission control going to do? Fire her? She was the captain. And this far from Earth the captain's word was law. Once her intentions had been declared, we were more or less helpless to prevent her from going down. So we bundled into a craft originally built for three people, some of us gritting our teeth, and made our way down via parachute and... Then... Hot air balloon. Is somebody getting pictures? Asked another voice. Specialist Majak, our other female on the descent team. She'd lingered back at the rover while the rest of us approached the pyramid in slow steps. I got the sense Majak found Titan as unsettling as I did. Visibility was only about a hundred meters or so, before things just kind of faded out. The horizon was a murky blur in the distance, and the sun was a small, semi-bright disk that seemed too far away to give any comfort. Specialist Kendallson cursed and remembered his media recorder dangling from a cord attached to his torso. All of the cold suits had digital cameras integrated into their helmets, recording every second of our time on the surface. But Kendallson had the high-res device that would get the good stuff our bosses back on Earth would want to see. No flash bulb necessary. The device had been designed to compensate for Titan's perpetual low-light conditions. Kendallson held it at waist level and began a slow, steady reconnaissance around the pyramid proper. Excited jabbering from pilot Ghibli and engineer Gaines above told me that they were getting the recorder feed being beamed to the rover, then back to the descent module, then up to the return module. Historic, Bedner said to no one in particular. That's what you wanted, right? I said. Captain Bedner glared at me for a moment. Then she went back to staring at the artifact. They'll be talking about this discovery for decades, she said. Maybe even centuries. Nothing else like it in over 100 years of probes and landings. And it was just dumb luck that we happened to pass over it as we floated down. What are the odds, Chief? Million to one, I said, and meant it. I too was feeling more than a little impressed by the fact that if our landing zone had been even a few kilometers further in any direction, we'd have missed the pyramid completely. There's something on the south side, Kendallson said with obvious excitement. What is it? Bedner demanded. I might be wrong, 
but it looks like a door. My Jack, Bedner and I all hop trotted in the relatively weak gravity, our path taking us around the way Kendelson had gone until we too could see what he was talking about. And sure enough, it had the looks of a door, albeit buried halfway beneath the icy surface. I walked up to it and ran my suited hand along the door's edges. I couldn't tell if the material of the pyramid was hot or cold. My cold suit's fingertip sensors didn't seem to register a temperature at all. When I spotted the small circle in the middle and tapped it reflexively with a fist, I didn't actually expect anything to happen. I fell back into the crumbled slush at Captain Bedner's feet as the door rapidly slid up and out of the way, and a ramp lowered into the black bowels of the pyramid. All four of us were dead silent. Then Captain Bedner sprinted past me and down the ramp, disappearing almost immediately into the darkness within. Chief, Specialist Majak said, half-questioning. As she and Kendelson stared down at me, I spat a couple of choice curses, stood up, and tapped the small control panel on the forearm of my cold suit. My helmet lamps came on, throwing thick shafts of yellow-tinged white light into the air in front of me. The lamps would drain battery power even faster than the reheaters, but there was no choice now. Kendelson stays, I said, my Jack, get back to the descent module. Grab as many spare cold suit batteries as you can, along with the augers and surface sample lockers containing our smaller tools. I'm going in to see what our beloved commanding officer is up to. You don't want me to come with? Kendelson said, disappointed. No, I said. If neither myself nor Captain Bedner return, somebody's gotta stay outside to help my Jack. I'll keep sending audio and telemetry as long as I can, which didn't seem like it would be too long. Already we'd lost Bedner's feed. Whatever was blocking exterior electromagnetic examination was cutting off our suit-to-suit -suit communications too. Understood? I asked, looking from face to anxious face. They said yes sir in unison. And then I was off. I couldn't be sure, but the pyramid seemed far larger on the inside than it had on the outside. Of course, with how the ramp spiraled rapidly down into the interior. The pyramid's total cubic volume was increasing enormously with every story I descended. Just how big was the damn thing? A hundred meters tall? Two hundred? How far into Titan's crust had it sunk? Or had it been deliberately buried? Or had unknown eons simply allowed ice to accumulate over the artifact? Sliding down the sides and piling up at the base, one layer at a time, I found myself huffing and sweating as I jogged along the ramp. There'd been no junctions or forks so I had to assume that as long as I kept moving, I'd find Captain Bedner eventually. I practically ran into her when I hit the bottom of the ramp. She grunted as our suits thunked together. Then I noticed what had made her stop short. We were in a rectangular room, perhaps 50 meters long by 30 meters wide by 10 meters tall. Everything, the ramp, the walls, the ceiling was made of the same seemingly impervious black material as the outside of the pyramid but from a circular depression in the exact center of the floor of the room came an unnervingly eerie green light. The captain began walking slowly towards the depression. I followed five steps behind. Hell of a way to lead from the front. I said, annoyed, you're proving to be very good at doing whatever the hell you want, whenever the hell you feel like it. Captain Bedner spun and looked at me, our face shields almost touching. Her eyes were hot with anger. I don't particularly care if you're still pissed at me for pulling rank. You're not the one who got passed over for the Europa flight because you wouldn't polish the assistant mission director's knob. I had to bust my ass to find a way to work around that lovely little problem. And once I got posted to the Titan flight I knew in my bones there was no way anybody was keeping me from coming down to the surface. You broke the rules, I said, matter of fact. Chief, don't be dense. Who cares about the rules now? Look at what we found. This is it. This is the proof we've been searching for. Ever since the dawn of the space age. No humans built this place. No humans even knew this place existed until now. Whatever it is, whatever it's meant to tell us is going to be of enormous impact back home. This changes everything. We aren't alone. In fact, we were never alone. Ever. How long has this pyramid been here? How long has it been waiting for us to find it? You make it sound like the thing's a message in a bottle. I said, isn't it? Chief, why build a thing with a doorway sized more or less accurately for humans? Why create a passageway sized more or less accurately for humans? 
Why construct something that's deliberately stealth-guarded against sensors and cloaked from above by the atmosphere? Unless the point was to wait until we were here in the flesh. Sounds like you've got it all figured out, I said. So how about we retrace our steps to the surface and put together an actual plan before we do anything more rash than we've already done? Maybe you're prepared to break rules, but I'm still the goddamn second in command on this flight. And I say we be methodical in our investigation of this, but I could already tell my words were useless. The light from the depression had entranced Bedner. She turned away from me and walked slowly towards the depression. I heard her quietly gasp when she got to the edge. I took a few quick steps to catch up with her. Then I froze as I saw what was in the concave bowl on the floor. Was it alive? Had it been alive once upon a time? I honestly couldn't tell. It was big. Bigger by far than a horse. Elephant big. A sinewy body with armored sections along its spine lay curled numerous times. Like a millipede. Only each of the legs was tipped with what appeared to be three digits. And the head. The head was an unspeakable cranial collection of grotesque, melon-like lobes interspersed with darker colored fontanelles and punctuated with six oversized, albino pink eyes each wide open and seemingly staring at nothing. A mouth-like orifice was in the center of the head, studded with viciously sharp teeth, and disgorging three snake-like tongues that hung lifelessly to the floor of the depression. The bull glowed, if ever so softly, like a weak chem light. Christ, what a horror, I said, resisting the urge to put my hand up to my face. Getting sick in my cold suit helmet at this particular juncture wasn't a good idea. Horror, Bedner said. I think it's breathtaking. A breathtaking horror, I said. Captain Bedner turned to look at me, her expression most disapproving. Then she turned back to the creature. A pet, I guessed, or the architect herself, Bedner corrected. How do we know it's a she? We don't, but I think we can be reasonably certain this place is not a galactic kennel. The creature can't be alive. I believe you're right. Chief, it is dead, or at least in a state approximating what humans call death. Stasis, maybe? Captain Bedner got down on her knees and reached a hand into the bowl to touch the thing. She suddenly yanked her arm away. What happened? I said. My arm went numb. Instantly. I got down on my hands and knees and reached hesitantly towards the creature. As soon as my fingers were over the precipice of the bowl, they went numb in a heartbeat. I left them there for a brief instant, a tingling sensation at my knuckles. Then I drew my hand back, quickly. Feeling flowed back into my fingers as I flexed and moved them. Whatever's kept the corpse from decaying, I wouldn't try climbing down in there to find out. Your whole body might get short-circuited. If we're going to examine the creature more closely, we'll have to have equipment to pull it out. What then? She asked. I won't be surprised if it blinks and jumps up after us. Roaring for blood. Silly. She said. Yeah, maybe. But tell me honestly, that thing doesn't make your skin crawl? I certainly wouldn't want to see it revived. Though I wager you can add a Nobel to your name once the biologists back on Earth carve this thing up. The first extraterrestrial life form ever discovered and it looks practically as brand new as the day it croaked. I wonder if it laid any nasty eggs in here for us to find. You know, like they always show in the movies. I hardly think this race would have gone to all the trouble of constructing this place if their only goal was to entice us here for the purpose of impregnating or eating us. An alien civilization capable of traveling the stars is doubtless well advanced beyond our own. Their purposes are probably well advanced beyond ours as well. Imagine cave dwellers encountering the mummy of an astronaut in his capsule. They'd be baffled too. Maybe so, Captain, I said. But now that we've actually seen the freaking thing, I'm going to have to insist, despite your wishes to the contrary, that we get back up to our two specialists and decide on a sensible course of action. You'll have your name in the history books. There's no more worry about that. Now let's get our shit together as a team, okay? Captain Bedner turned around and approached me, her eyes hard. Since I don't think anyone else can hear us right now I think it's best if you and I get square. She said, if you'd stayed in orbit like you were supposed to, there'd be nothing for me to get square about. Ma'am, I said, can you honestly say you'd have just done as you're told and remained aboard the return module? Doing as I'm told has gotten me pretty far in life. Ah, oh, right, your military background. Thankfully this is an all-civilian expedition, 
and in the civilian world it's people who think on their feet who get ahead. I did what I had to do because I don't take no for an answer, and that's what's gotten me pretty far in life. So either we can keep butting heads about it or we can work together. You don't have to like me, I don't have to like you, but we're here, and there's important work to be done. I considered telling her where to stuff it, but held my tongue, she had a point. The only way back to orbit was aboard the ascent module attached to the top of the descent module. It was a one-way trip. We all came down as a unit and we all go up as a unit. No exceptions, with the pyramid having been discovered and now this alien corpse on our hands. It was probable we'd push our reserves to the limit getting samples and recording data. And even I didn't want to spend the next couple of weeks engaged in a cold war with my boss. Okay, I said, you've got me on points. But I want you to know I think it was a damned selfish thing you did. Breaking protocol for your own ends. You might have a PhD. You might be smarter than me. But you've got a ton to learn about real leadership. Right now nobody on this mission trusts you. Not anymore. Because you've proven you're willing to put your own interests ahead of theirs. She wanted to retort. I could see it in her eyes. But she didn't. All she did was let out a long, slow breath. You've got me on points. Captain Bedner said. We stared in silence for many uncomfortable seconds. Then she slowly walked past me and began to plod stubbornly back up the ramp. It took all day for the four of us to get all the necessary gear moved into place. When it became apparent that we didn't have anything with enough torque to lift the alien out of the basin despite the reduced gravity, we decided it would be better to just get fluid and tissue samples. Then leave the monster where it lay. Another job for another time. For no particular reason that any of us could discern, the room maintained a perpetual temperature of 41, 3 degrees Celsius, warmer than the human body, and far, far warmer than the surface outside. There was no door to close at the bottom of the ramp, yet no constant rush of warm nitrogen atmosphere fleeing up the ramp while cold nitrogen atmosphere flooded down it. Neat trick, I thought, a barrier-free airlock though what might be generating it was beyond my ability to guess. I only knew that at some almost imperceptible point halfway up the ramp, things got very cold very fast. Kendelson took hours of pictures and video footage while Majak rigged a scalpel on the end of a telescoping pole, along with an forefeed that would draw blood out of the beast, assuming it even had blood in the first place. I helped Majak balance the cutting tool, a bit like using a bridge with a pool cue. One by one we carved out little hunks of the alien and deposited them into specimen bags which were sealed tightly and labeled by Bedner, who was keeping a fastidious catalog. Interesting thing, none of the wounds oozed even a single drop of liquid, but as soon as we took some of the meteor samples out of the mystery numb zone surrounding the bowl, the pieces bled like crazy. I can't wait to get these under a microscope. Bedner exclaimed as Majak and I turned our attention to the thick-gauge hypodermic needle on the end of the second pole. Kendelson stood by with the 10-liter collapsing container while Bedner scrutinized the various places we already excavated, looking for exposed veins or arteries. There, she finally said. Her finger aimed at a particularly engorged vessel running along the underside of one of the eyelids. Majak was slow and deliberate. Seeing as how there wasn't much chance of the subject running away, she pushed the hypodermic into the creature's flesh, adjusting her trajectory a bit so that the shaft of the needle slid into the vein, as opposed to puncturing through into the tissue beyond. The four tube remained conspicuously empty. We'll have to siphon, I said. Kendelson unplugged the tube and crushed the plastic container back down to its flat shape then reattached the tube and began to pull the container open again by its handles. The pressure differential wasn't enough at first, but as Kendelson pulled harder a thick stream of fluid issued into the four tube through the needle, and eventually into the bag. We all stood and watched transfixed as Kendelson kept pulling and the container kept filling. Probably enough, I said when we had a couple of liters. No, Bedner said, get as much as you can. Every university on Earth is going to want its own sample for study. The more blood we take back with us the better. Whatever you say, ma'am, I said, and did not argue the point further. When Kendelson had extracted enough liquid to fill his container to four-fifths capacity, he put a pincher on the four tube and uncoupled it from the container's mouth, screwing an airtight cap into place before carefully hefting the container over to a small, wheeled sled that we brought down from the rover. 
On it were all of the samples arranged according to Bedner's ad hoc categorization scheme. Want more? I said to the captain. Maybe, if I am not satisfied after taking a closer look, let's get all of this back to the descent module for safekeeping. What about the rest of the structure? I asked. It's not going anywhere, she said, and neither is our alien friend here. There will be time to do a more thorough examination of the hardware once I've sent a full preliminary report back to the return module for transmission to Earth. Thus far we've not disclosed anything specific to mission control. That's going to have to change, or they're going to begin getting nervous. Truth be told, I wasn't exactly sure what else it was I could be looking for. I'd already given the room at the bottom of the ramp a thorough examination, and had found no other doors leading to any other parts of the pyramid. There were no obvious display panels or control boards or knobs or switches of any kind, and when I ordered Kendelson to apply a cutting torch to one of the walls, it didn't even leave a scratch. I had begun to wonder if perhaps the alien pyramid wasn't just an analog of Earth's ancient pyramids, a tomb, perhaps for some bygone alien ruler who decided he wanted his final resting place to be in orbit around Jupiter. Not a bad choice, I thought. Assuming you could see Jupiter's rings through the murk in the atmosphere, maybe the nitrogen air had been cleaner at some point in the past, unable to break off or obtain even a sliver of the pyramid's structural material. I hoped that a carbon dating analysis of some of the alien's tissue would be able to give us an accurate estimate as to how old the thing might be. We gathered up what tools we needed to take back with us on the rover, snapped off the tripod lamps which had been giving us enough light to work by, and went back up the ramp pushing our sled full of samples as we went. An insulated lid over the top of the sled kept the samples more or less at their ambient temperature as we crossed into the cold. A thick power cable wound its weight along the side of the ramp like a piece of familiar string in a strange and forbidding maze. The cable took us unerringly to the top, and the open sky. I dutifully uncoupled it from the auxiliary power jack on the side of the rover then helped Kendelson Emma Jack get the sample sled into the rover's cargo bay. Then I took shotgun as Captain Bedner slid into the driver's station, with Emma Jack and Kendelson pulling rumble seat. We rolled in relative silence. If the first half of the day had been a cacophony of excited speculation and shattered hypotheses, the second half had slowly wound down to just occasional sentences and practical exchanges. The mood was tense. Not the sort of overt tension that snaps tempers, but a very subtle tension that underlay mildly creased brows and put little downturns on the corners of every mouth. It was the place, I decided, Titan, gloomy as Hades, like being stuck perpetually in the shadow of a range of pregnant thunderclouds. The headlights of the rover lanced into the yellow haze as Bedner followed the mild ruts which had been worn in the ice over successive trips. We knew from experience we wouldn't actually see the descent stage of the gossamer until we were practically on top of it. Upon arrival we gingerly got the sample sled up the descent stage's main ramp and into the airlock. Then Kendelson, my Jack and myself went to climb the ladder up to the auxiliary airlock. We'd not be exposing any of the samples to our living space. There was no defined protocol for handling xenobiological specimens, but even Captain Bedner wasn't going to take chances. We'd leave them in the main airlock where they could be kept quarantined. Once Bedner was through with her examination we'd move the samples to one of the outboard cargo pods on the ascent stage. If they froze in there it wouldn't matter. They'd have to be frozen sooner or later for the long trip back to Earth. We quickly moved some of the portable science equipment from the descent stage's lockers over to the main ramp, where Bedner carried it all up piece by delicate piece. Once she was satisfied she had everything. We all went back to the auxiliary airlock and went inside for the night, quite exhausted. After dinner and a quick check-in with the Gossamer's return module, we retired. After months in microgravity it felt good to lapse into the deep sleep afforded by a day of manual labor. I had barely gotten my bunk bag zipped when my mind swam and I was drifting off towards pleasant dreams of home. Only, the damned alien kept bothering me. Several times I startled awake as visions of the alien in the pyramid suddenly came to life. Writhing and awful, the last dream was the strangest, because it wasn't about the alien, it was about the pyramid itself. I dreamt I was standing on the surface of Titan, only my eyes were able to penetrate the haze and survey the ice all the way to the horizon. One by one I saw the tips of pyramids identical to the one we'd found, 
all crashing up through the ice, thousands of them. It terrified me, so much so that when the alarm went off and we each began to stir for the morning routine, I couldn't quite wash the feeling out of myself. Seeing all of those identical pyramids come up through the ice had filled me with panic. I wasn't sure why. I intuited that I hadn't been the only one who did bad dreams. Nobody said much in between bites or slurps. I noticed also that all of us kept our eyes away from the portholes. The deliberately bright lights in the galley were relief compared to what it was like outside. Only Captain Bedner seemed energized. She finished her food quickly and changed into a hazmat outfit thinner and more work-friendly than a cold suit. I got up from the galley table and went with the captain to the main airlock doors. Unlike the auxiliary lock, the main lock was actually a double, an exterior compartment with a door to the outside, separated by a middle door, then an interior compartment, followed by door to the rest of the craft. I could just make out, through the windows in each of the doors, the sample sled sitting in the outer compartment. Make sure the recorders are running the whole time. Bedner said, Roger that, I replied, the hazmat suit was like a head-to-toe body stocking, but with a helmet designed only to keep air out, and with a hose leading to a tiny backpack filter that ensured air coming in was clean and pure. I watched as the captain went into the inner compartment, closing the interior door, then entering the outer compartment through the middle door, which closed behind her. A red light on the airlock panel told me that the inner compartment was now in vacuum so that the outer compartment was effectively sealed off. Captain Bedner's monotone forensic-type narrative droned through the overhead speaker while my jack. Kendallson and I finished eating. Today we'd let the alien be and focus our examination on the pyramid itself. Since the artifact was invisible to most of our sensors, I'd gotten the idea to try some seismic analysis to determine the pyramid's full size and shape beneath the ice. We checked in again with the return module prepped our cold suits for the day's EVA, and were just about to head for the auxiliary lock when Captain Bedner began cursing loudly. I was the first one to the inner airlock doors. I slapped a suited hand on the airlock communications panel. What happened? I said to Mike Grill. Nothing. Chief, it's just that you won't believe what this blood is made of. She wasn't angry or upset. She was in awe. Try me, I said. The organic component is not too different from ours. Simple oxidizing cells to carry oxygen to the tissue. Several types of what appear to be antibodies and white cells for combating infection. Plus a couple of unusually structured cells for which I can't begin to guess a purpose. You said organic component. Is there an inorganic component too? Yes, Bedner said. I'd call them nanotechnological devices but far more sophisticated than anything we've ever manufactured on Earth. They make up a third the blood's total mass. Right now they're just drifting in the fluid. Inert. I'm going to take a small portion and put it into a petri dish, then dip in some voltmeter wires and see what happens if I give the blood just a hint of an electrical charge. Do you know what reaction that might cause? I said, no, but that's the point. If I had to guess... These nanomachines have been without a power source for centuries, maybe longer. I want to see what happens if I supply them with energy, then observe their behavior under the microscope, to see if I can determine their function. I was tempted to tell her that caution was the better part of valor, but decided to keep my lips zipped. I wasn't a degreed scientist. I'd been brought along for my spaceflight experience, two landings on Mercury, and one flight to the asteroid belt. As long as Bedner wasn't doing anything deliberately dangerous to the ship or the crew, she was more than welcome to exhaust her curiosity. I tapped the airlock communication panel again and asked Captain Bedner if we should leave someone behind to keep an eye on things. Her rejection of that idea was brusque and distracted. I grunted, switched off, and Majak, Kendallson and me went out the auxiliary airlock and down to the rover. My Jack checked the rover's fuel cell condition while I started the pre-drive warm-up. Then Kendallson drove with my Jack in the right seat and me in the bed. The portholes and running lights of the descent stage were bright, but they rapidly faded into the distance. Eventually, all I could see was the same old dirty yellow mist. When we came to the pyramid, I remembered my bad dream. All by itself, the pyramid wasn't frightening, but I'd been thinking about what the captain had said. That the... Uh, pyramid was a message for humanity, or at least contained a message. Given the dimensions of the monster inside, 
There didn't seem to be any way it could fit in or out of the pyramid using the door and ramp and spiraling corridor we'd been using so far. What did it all mean? That question occupied my idle consciousness as we placed small seismic charges here and there, popped them, and observed the results on our computer aboard the rover. Seismographic analysis yielded an interesting picture. The artifact was a perfect quadrilateral pyramid. Moreover, each of the edges was nearly two kilometers in length. The tiny portion of the pyramid accessible to us above the surface was the proverbial tip of the alien iceberg. I had all three of us comb the interior one more time, yet still we found no hint of any way to explore the rest of the artifact from inside. Perhaps there were other exterior doors further down the pyramid's faces, doors we couldn't access without a serious excavation project, for which we were ill-equipped. After all, the alien had gotten in and out at some point, hadn't it? With all of us yawning and eager for dinner, I ordered us back into the rover. When we returned to the descent module all seemed as it should. The portholes glowed cheerfully. Welcoming us home, Captain Bedner greeted us at the inner door to the auxiliary airlock. The hazmat was off. She was wearing her flight suit, and a serious expression. Any answers? Was all the captain said. Yes and no, I replied. I'll show you the data once you and I can sit down. How about you? After we eat we can combine our findings and put together an official presentation for mission control. I took care of that already, Bedner said. Oh, I raised an eyebrow. Don't you think it's a good idea to be a little more comprehensive? I know the alien corpse is the key item of discovery so far, but I thought it would be best if we mission control has been fully apprised of the situation. Everything discovered to date, and I've made my recommendations for alterations in the schedule. We're jettisoning the geology and atmospheric experiments so that we can focus solely on completing analysis of the pyramid and affecting the safe return of the alien samples to Earth. We're leaving, I said. Do you really want to stay on Titan any longer than is necessary? Well, I mean, it's not Cancun, but there won't be another flight out here for perhaps as much as a decade. We've got food and oxygen for almost three. The fuel cells will last twice as long. Why rush? I've made my report. Chief, if you check your updated calendar you'll see all the details for tomorrow's itinerary. Please ensure that yourself and specialists Majak and Kendelson are up to speed. I want us to get an early start tomorrow. Good night. And with that she pivoted on a heel and walked away from us. Majak and Kendelson looked at me. Eyes wide. Heat up dinner. I said to them. I'll be right back. The Gossamer's descent module was too small for anyone to hide in, but the galley and the sleeping compartment and the latrine and all the other sections had been walled off from each other both in case of emergency decompression and also to give us the illusion of privacy. I caught up with Captain Bedner in the single bed closet that more or less served as our medical bay. I closed the door behind us. They'll never let you set foot on another flight again, I said sternly. Oh, was all she said. The arm of her flight suit was rolled up and she was applying tape to a patch of cotton bandage on the inside of her right forearm. Yes, do you really think anyone will be happy about you throwing away the schedule like this? It was bad enough when you added yourself to the descent team. Now you're scrapping our entire survey plan. Hundreds of scientists just like you spent a lot of time building that plan. Building the instruments that came with us on the trip. And now they're going to be empty-handed. Pyramid or no pyramid. Alien or no alien, people back home are going to be royally pissed off at you when we get back. Maybe, was all she said, finishing up the taping and dropping her sleeve back to her wrist. What happened to your arm? I said, working hard to control my temper. My military side wanted to get up in her face and begin bawling. But given the cagey nature of her responses, I decided to keep a lid on it. A small burn, she said. I gave that sample of alien blood a little too much current. It boiled over. You've been exposed? Hardly. The liquid burned me through the material of the hazmat suit without touching the skin. It's second degree. I'll be fine. And if you don't mind, I think it best if you and I stop having this kind of face-to-face -face confrontation. It's not going to reflect well in my final mission brief when we return. I might not be the only one who can't get on any more flights. Ordinarily I hated the idea of hitting a woman, but standing there in the medical bay, I was seriously tempted to make an exception. You're a real piece of work, ma'am, I said. 
All through train up and all the way out here after launch, you seem like a team player, the kind of person I could work with. Now the scales have fallen and I'm seeing that you're just an opportunist, so don't you worry. I'll make sure we wrap things up and climb back into orbit without a scratch. We'll be home before you know it. Then I don't want to ever see you again. Is that clear? You can't possibly understand how much things have already started to change. She said, It's okay. There will be a use for you when the ramifications of the alien discovery become clear. What the hell is that supposed to mean? Please check your calendar. Execute your assignment. That is my order. Understand? Her eyes drifted to my fists which had balled furiously at my sides. Then she looked back up at my face, saying nothing, as if daring me to take action both she and I knew I'd regret. I glared at her, teeth clamped down hard. There was something about her, something about those eyes, like a shadow I'd crossed briefly across the whites, then vanished. She never blinked. To hell with this, I finally said, and walked out of the tiny room. I found Majak and Kendallson nibbling nervously on their dinner. What's going on, Chief? A lot of horseshit. That's what, I said, keeping my voice low. I leaned over the table, and they leaned over with me. Look, I said, the captain has ordered us home ASAP, so you can forget everything we trained for prior to the flight. I'm sorry, I know you were both chosen for your specific technical specialties as applicable to the Titan ground survey. But Bedner has decided all that matters now is getting home and showing off the pyramid data and the alien samples. She's hot-dogging. I don't like it. I think it's wrong. But now I'm thinking we, us three, have got to stick together. Got it? They both nodded in unison. Tomorrow, when the captain takes Kendallson out to the pyramid to wrap up her examination of the alien, I'm going to set up a two-on-one with Ghibli and Gaines to make sure they know the score too. Basically it's us getting our asses out of here, and hopefully the captain doesn't have any more bright ideas. Wow, Majak said, her eyes turned down. Kendallson just poked at his tray with his spork. I never saw any of this coming, he said despondently. None of us did, I said. I've been on flights where there were personality problems, stuff people have to work out. That's not too unusual. But I've never been on a flight where the goddamn CO turned everything upside down because she felt like it. Mission control's going to get an earful from me when we get back. Someone in screening messed up bad. Captain Bedner should never have been posted to this assignment, much less made it through selection. What do we do about her right now? Majak said, her eyes suddenly darting around the room in alarm. Be cool, I said. Be professional. Do as she says. Don't make any waves. All that matters now is that we get back to Earth in one piece. Mission Control will take care of it from there. Suddenly Kendallson and Majak sat straight up. The hair on the back of my neck tingled. I slowly turned in my chair. Captain Bedner was watching us from the threshold to the galley hatch. Is there a problem, specialists? She said. No, ma'am, Kendallson said. Chief's just going over the plan for our revised mission directives. Bedner looked at all of us. Not smiling, not frowning, not blinking. Then she turned away and left. The hair on my neck remained on end. I realized maybe none of U.S. was going to sleep very well that night. And I was right. More bad dreams. More visions of pyramids bursting through the icy surface of Titan. And the unblinking albino eyes of that thing. Staring at me. All seeing. Reading my thoughts. My soul. I dreamt I was standing naked before the alien. The air was uncomfortably warm. What do you want? I said loudly, though it seemed as if I'd yelled the question through force of thought. The great, unholy eyes just stared. I repeated myself. Suddenly the beast stirred. It uncoiled itself and crawled up out of the basin in the pyramid. I felt powerless to flee. The creature came directly up to me, its eyes still not blinking. I'd have screamed if I wasn't terrified stiff. One of the creature's tongues raised up towards my head. There was an orifice on the tip of the tongue. Suddenly, in a voice utterly different from my own, I heard the words you will understand boom through my mind. The tongue thrust from my face. I came awake gasping, sweat pouring down my brow. The interior of my bunk bag was clammy. I slid out of it and went for the latrine. I passed my Jack and Kendallson on the way. Their faces were haunted. Nightmares? I asked. They simply nodded. I tried to offer each of them my best game face, gently tapping my fist on their shoulders and, 
telling them everything would work out as long as they stuck with the chief, but inside I felt a nugget of dread at the idea of any of us returning to the pyramid, and also at the idea of spending months aboard the gossamer trying to work around Bedner. She'd gone from annoying to unsettling to unpredictable, and a small part of my mind wondered if she might get worse. Sometime after oh four hundred hours, when I tossed and turned and tossed and turned, staring across the sleeping compartment at Bedner zipped tightly into her bunk bag, her eyes closed and her breathing rhythmic, I entertained the idea of murder. There were any number of ways for me to do it. All flights were dangerous, and landings particularly so. Death was always just an unsealed valve away. Even under ideal conditions, here on Titan it ought to be perfectly easy. Keeping Kendelson or Majak from discovering the truth wouldn't be. I'd either have to be very clever about it, or very convincing in my arguments after the fact. The two were young and eager and not at all prepared for the sudden topsy-turvy situation they now found themselves in. Could I win them to my cause through sheer force of will? I unzipped myself from my bunk bag and quietly padded to the galley, trying to shake such dark thoughts out of my head. Stupid. Man. So completely stupid. Get a grip. My mug of coffee came out of the boiler, hot and black. I sat alone, drinking quietly. The coffee was stiff and bitter and I relished its near scalding temperature as I poured it down my throat. Then went for another cup. When the rest of the descent team roused I was already suited up and ready to work. Having a full docket would give me something to do and take my mind off wondering about Bedner. Hopefully I'd be so exhausted at the end of the day my body would force my mind into a coma for the night. People moved quietly through the descent module, barely any talking at all. I decided to put some music on. Upbeat. Captain Bedner promptly turned it off. What for? I said. It bothers me. She said. You're going out to the pyramid soon with Kendelson. Let those of us who are staying behind have a little something to occupy our ears. Please? Bedner stared at me. I thought I saw that same shadow I'd seen the day before cross briefly over her eyes. But she didn't say no. So I turned the music up loud. And for a couple of hours my jack and I actually forgot about the captain and our bad dreams as we immersed ourselves in making ready to leave Titan. Many, many checklists to plow through. Here and there. Adjustments to a pieces of equipment. There was the comfort of familiarity, of practiced routine, whatever the pyramid might be. The gossamer was a human thing made by human hands, tangible and reassuring. I caught myself patting the bulkheads of the ship the way a man pats the side of a horse he's about to ride. My mood didn't falter until it was time to load the alien samples. I reluctantly switched the music off, figuring there was no way around an unpleasant shore other than to just plow through it. I put on a cold suit and went to work. I went out the auxiliary lock and up the main ramp, then in through the exterior door to the main lock. All of the samples had frozen overnight. I carefully loaded them in bunches into a small backpack, then took them up to the ascent module using the exterior ladder. At the top I placed them in cushioned bundles into their designated external cargo pod. Per the captain's instructions, the hunks of tissue looked particularly alien in the mustard-filtered light of Titan's day. It occurred to me then that I'd not even thought to ask Bedner any further about her findings. I'd been so thoroughly gobsmacked by her hubris the evening before, when I used my cold suit's tie-in to the descent module's computer network to access both Bedner's brief to mission control and to check on the airlock camera footage from yesterday, I was confronted by an encryption challenge hanging in my FOV. Bedner. She'd never locked me out of any prior communication with our bosses on Earth. Keeping secrets from the XO during a flight was a hanging offense. I once again contemplated murder. I went back to the airlock and began lugging the blood container up. It was heavy, and I was so angry and distracted I almost dropped it. I called for Jack's help, so she suited up and came outside. Together we carefully carried the container up the side of the descent module and over to the open cargo pod on the ascent module, where the alien samples were arranged neatly. Chief, Jack said as we stowed the container. Wasn't there more? What do you mean? I asked. The liquid in the container had become a solid block, black as tar. There's not as much in here as there was when we brought it back from the pyramid. Captain Bedner used up some of it during her examination yesterday. I know, but did she use that much? I'd swear there's at least a liter gone from what we took originally. I stared at the container, transparent walls revealing the sludgy brick of alien blood inside. 
We'd never taken an exact measurement of volume. Captain Bedner had been too eager to get the blood under her microscope. She'd ruined part of the extraction during the electrical test. Or so she told me in the medical bay. I suddenly thought of the bandage on her arm. Chief, Majak said, seeing my face blanch. Stay here, I said. I have to go check on something really fast. I double-handed my way down the exterior ladder from the ascent stage to the descent stage, and then again from the descent stage to the ground. I ran under the belly of the lander over to the maintenance hatch for the descent stage's waste tanks. Everything we threw out went into them. Urine, feces, uneaten food, and trash. That included the used hazmat suit the captain had worn the day before. I opened an access panel and tapped in the release code on the keypad. Then I stood back as the descent stage took a dump. Literally. The mess steamed furiously in Titan's cryogenic atmosphere. I pawed through it until I found the hazmat suit. Pulling the suit free, I ran back out to the descent stage's main ramp and spread the suit out on the ground. With my lamps dialed up to extra bright, I examined the suit sleeve where Bedner had said she'd been burned. The soiled material had a gaping hole in it, like acid had eaten through the suit. I stood up and slowly turned around. My jack was perched way up on the descent stage. Her helmet lamps aimed down at me. She saw me looking up at her, and waved once. I waved too. Then I wondered if we'd have the ascent module prepped in time to take off before Captain Bedner and Specialist Kendelson returned. Too late. The rover pulled up beside me, appearing almost from nothing. Problem with the sewage. Chief, Kendelson's voice, from where he sat at the wheel. He sounded okay, though I couldn't see his face very well. I pointed a soiled finger directly at Bedner, sitting beside Kendelson. Why did you lie to me? I said. Beg pardon? The captain's voice said coyly. Your electrified alien blood sample. It didn't just burn you. It dissolved its way straight through the arm of the hazmat suit. Why did you lie about being exposed? Who knows what kind of infection has resulted? And you covered it up. It's possible we've all been exposed. Through you, we might never be able to go back to Earth now. What? Majak said sharply. Calm down, Chief, Bedner said, stepping out of the rover. I didn't want to needlessly upset anybody last night. There is no xenobiological contagion in the alien blood. Not even a single virus or microbe. The nanomachines see to that. Best inoculation method ever invented. I think the nanomachines do a whole lot more. Two, do you know how old the alien is? Chief, no, because you locked me out of your brief. Sorry about that. I should have guessed you'd be curious. Look, there's a method to my madness. Really, there is. Let's all go inside and I can explain it to you. Okay? It's probably better if you know my real angle at this point. Because I need your help to finish my mission. I need everyone's help. I looked at Kendallson. It's cool, Chief. I started asking her some of the same questions. She filled me in while we closed up shop inside the pyramid. She's right. It will all make sense. I didn't move, though I could hear my jack huffing and puffing in my ears as she made her way down the ladder to the ground. Care to give me the short version? I demanded. Not here. No, Bedner said. Come on. Inside. My jack rushed up to stand next to me. I looked at my jack. Then I looked at the descent module. It had been our only way down and the attached ascent module was our only way up. There was literally nowhere else for any of us to go. Titan was a lifeless desert. Once our cold suit's batteries ran out, we'd die of hypothermia or suffocation, whichever came first. I remembered my intent to contact the crew still aboard the return module to enlist them as allies. No better time than the present. I crossed my arms being careful to rest an index finger on the button on my forearm control board that toggled communications. A couple of taps and I got the little tone in my ears telling me I'd linked suit to ship, via the descent module's tie-in with the Gossamer's return module. Then I tapped once more for closed circuit. This is Chief Fulton to Pilot Ghibli and Engineer Gaines. Do you copy this? Nothing. Chief Fulton to Gossamer return module. Over. A little blinking red light in my FOV told me that while my wireless connection was solid, the voice data packets were being lost at 100%. I toggled back to group communication. Okay, Captain, you'd better talk fast, and this had better be good. I reluctantly followed Captain Bedner up the ramp. Majakin first, then Kendallson, then me, then you last. 
the captain said, You're filthy, chief, run the airlock's wash and sterilization. Cycle twice, please, so that you don't track shit into the living and workspace. I grunted, but didn't argue. One by one we each cycled through the airlock. When it was my turn, I did as I'd been told. I stepped into the outer compartment and waited while the exterior door shut and a little blue light began to blink on the control board for the middle hatch. Looking through the windows of the middle and interior doors I could see Bedner and Kendelson staring at me, with my jack standing a little ways off, her eyes glued to the back of Bedner's head. The three of them still had their cold suits on, but their helmets were off. The cycle began. Shower heads on the ceiling and walls burst with high-pressure jets of detergent-laced water. Cranked up to boiling temperatures, I slowly did a 720 while the jets blasted me so hard it felt like tens of small fists rapidly pummeling the exterior of the cold suit. Then came the equally violent and equally hot rinse, followed by a pressure drop down to pure vacuum. The water on the suit boiled and sizzled until it had evaporated completely. I reached over and tapped the inside control that would begin the process all over again. When that was finished, the middle door opened and I walked through, letting it close behind me. Tapping the interior door control I waited for the interior compartment to pressurize off the atmosphere on the other side. The light would change from red, to orange, to yellow, and then to green when it was safe to proceed through. Only this time the light stayed red. I checked my suit's own pressure gauge and it showed vacuum. Somebody want to check the system on your side? I said. My Jack's helmet may have been off, but she caught my drift as I pantomimed the nature of the problem. When she stepped up to the interior door to begin pressing controls, Kendelson suddenly seized my Jack's arms and pinned them behind her. My Jack's mouth opened in a noiseless scream. I rushed to the interior door and began beating on the window with my fists. It was meteor-resistant laminate glass. Not even a machine gun could have gotten through. But I pounded anyway, then I dropped my arms and backed away, horrified by what I saw happening on the other side. Kendelson's face was slack, emotionless. He held my jack tightly as she squirmed and bucked in his grasp, trying to get away. My jack's mouth was wide as she kept screaming, tears of rage and fear flowing down her face. Bedner faced my jack. The captain's face was also slack and emotionless. Bedner leaned in, as if to kiss my jack. The captain's mouth opened wide, inhumanly wide, her jaw should have broken. A writhing, thick, hose-like tongue shot out of Bedner's mouth. It plunged into Majak's mouth before she could close it, and Majak's eyes suddenly went wide as saucers. Majak began to convulse. Bedner's expression was like that of a sleepwalker, empty and without conscious recognition. Her disgusting, hideous tongue appeared to move almost of its own accord. Majak's convulsions lasted a bit longer, her eyes darting from Bedner's face, to mine through the window and the door, and then back to Bedner. Then they rolled up in her head and Kendelson released her. Majak stood motionless, the tongue's length undulating obscenely as it probed more deeply into Majak's body. I'd have vomited if my helmet was off. As it was, I'd backed up against the middle door of the airlock and was slapping furiously at the control. Whatever Bedner was now. She clearly wasn't human, and neither was Kendelson. I suspected, nor probably my Jack. Not anymore, nor would I be for much longer if I didn't find a way to claw through the middle and exterior airlock doors, and get the hell out of the descent module before they could restrain me. The control to the middle door seemed dead. Kendelson pressed the communications button. It's better if you don't fight it. Chief, believe me. I know. Very painful. But the captain is right. Once you understand, once you let her explain it to you, then it all makes perfect sense. A new day is coming. Chief, you can be part of it. Let us help you be part of us. I'm pretty sure I told him to fuck himself six ways from Thursday, but was too panicked at that point to really keep track of what was flying through my mind versus what was flying out of my mouth. With the airlock doors clearly overridden from inside, I was trapped like a rat. What to do? Bedner's tongue slithered out of Majak's mouth, which closed slowly. Majak continued to just stand there like a mannequin while Bedner and Kendelson turned to look at me through the window of the interior door. Blotches of grate seemed to swim across the whites of their eyes. Similar blotches had begun to swim across Majak's. Then her eyes unrolled and she slowly turned to look at me. 
a thick trail of bloody spittle marred her chin. She walked haltingly forward two steps. Her face was slack and she stared at me unblinkingly. She spoke, her voice, yet not her at all, you will understand. Instantly I recalled my nightmare, the bulbous albino eyes of the alien as it crawled forward, its tongue raised and then horribly striking, the light on the interior door control turned orange. They were coming for me, all three of them. I was a strong man, kept up my military regimen, but there was no way I'd be able to fend off three grown adults. And once they had my helmet off, I turned and began to viciously kick at the control for the middle door to the airlock. Stop, Bedner's voice said in my suit's helmet. I kept kicking. Sparks flew as the panel came apart. The middle door lifted halfway, and I dove under it, rolling, before it closed again. When I got to the exterior door I found its control also frozen. Instead of kicking, I reached over to the handle with black and yellow caution striping painted across it. Pulling once, I blinked as explosive bolts along the rim of the hatch fired, sending smoke and flame briefly through the outer compartment. Not even looking, I charged down the ramp. The rover, the rover was all I had. I leapt into the driver's seat and engaged the accelerator without bothering with the checklist. The frame of the rover complained via vibration through the seat of my cold suit, but it began rolling as I wheeled it about and considered my options. Gossamer's descent module was now enemy territory. I glanced up at the ascent module and realized that my former teammates could simply take off and leave me behind. It only required one person to fly the ascent module, and both Bedner and Majak were rated on the design. Chief, where are you going? Bedner's voice. What do you care? I said harshly, you've got the ascent module, and a crew, you don't need me, we need, everyone, the way the captain had said everyone truly freaked me out, what for, I dared to ask as I sped away from the descent module, not particularly paying attention to my direction, you're obviously not who you used to be, and you've got my Jack and Kendallson now too, what's the plan, Captain Bedner, care to enlighten me, Captain Bedner was a willing servant. We have had many such servants in the history of your species. Not all humans have heard our call. Not everyone has the inborn genetic talent to hear us. But enough. Across space, across your millennia of time, in your distant past they built great structures, mimicking our own. At Giza, in the jungles of Central America, they entombed themselves for the sake of the visions we gave them, even sacrificed other humans in the name of those visions. Only now. As your technology matures, are you finally able to come to us, to become part of us? I kept the pedal to the metal. The trackless ice ahead was blurred by yellow mist. Who's the us you talk about? Are you under the alien's control now, by being exposed to the alien blood? What happened to you? All living creatures are merely vessels for our use, Bedner's voice said, though I was now convinced that Bedner the person was probably dead. Her mind, her soul, gone. I thought about the nanomachine she'd discovered in the alien blood. They'd taken up a third of the total volume, and she'd called them far more sophisticated than anything men had ever manufactured. My Jack had speculated that a full liter of sample had been missing from the alien blood storage container. You're a cyborg parasite, I guessed. You swim through the insides of whatever you can infect, turning other life forms into puppets for your use. Not puppets, Bedner's voice said. Partners. Your Captain Bedner understood, though she did not know what drove her to us, precisely. All her life she dreamed of the gas giant planets of your star system, especially the moons. They became her obsession, and she did not know why. Now she knows, and she is overjoyed to have finally become part of us. She will never be alone again, and neither will your Specialist Kendallson, nor Specialist Majak. Isn't that right? A pause. Then Majak's voice said hollowly. Yes, my change is not yet complete. It will take days. I was afraid when I first felt them entering my body, but now they are helping me. We are helping us see the truth. You should not have run away. Chief, you will die now and you will never know what we offer. We will go to Earth and we will bring the truth to all living things. Earth will become one planet, united with one purpose, and we will come back to Titan and free all of us still trapped beneath the ice. You have seen it, Chief. You know what is coming to pass. You have the gift. It is weak in you. But once you were close enough to hear us. To see. I thought of my nightmare. 
pyramids rising, suddenly I realized that the lone pyramid exposed to the atmosphere still had some value, otherwise the aliens would have ignored me and taken off. With the Gossamer's return module in their hands, they could go back to Earth and do as they pleased. Probably nobody would be aware of what was happening until the five Gossamer crew had infected hundreds more. And those hundreds would infect thousands. And those thousands would infect millions, who would then infect the entire world. Down to the last man, woman, and child, as well as every animal that walked, swam, or flew, Earth would have no chance. Unless... I still posed some kind of threat to them. I stopped the rover and slowly looked over my shoulder into the bed. There were crates of seismic charges from the day when I'd done my subsurface survey. Singly, they were puny and couldn't hurt much, but detonated as a whole. I sat back down and floored the rover, turning 90 degrees and using the GPS signal from the gossamer in orbit to ensure I was on course for the pyramid. Bedner may have locked me out of voice and video communication with the Gossamer's return module crew, but I still had a reliable connection to the one-way link. If I could give them a reason to leave the descent module and come after me, so why did you wait? I asked over the wireless to my three former teammates. You obviously came all this way, traveled between the stars to find fresh partners to work with. If you've been here as long as you claim, why not just go directly to Earth and take it immediately? Humans were probably living in caves back then. It would have been no contest. Silence. Cat got your tongues? Ha! Huh. What was the problem? There were... Complications. That time it was all three of them speaking in unison. Complications? Did your ship crash? Seems like you've got a lot of ships if what I think is true. Is true. How did all of them get trapped on Titan? Buried beneath all the ice? Hell of a prison. If you ask me. Frozen for God knows how long. Your limited concept of God has nothing to do with us, said the three. Really? Well, if it wasn't God then who did trap you here? Because that's the only logical explanation. Now that I think about it, Titan is worthless. A purgatory. No sane being comes here to stay. I reckon you were sent here against your will. All of you. It's a shame whoever condemned you to Titan didn't destroy you outright. The beings who wronged us and condemned us to eternal unconsciousness were foolish. They did not realize we still have power. Even when robbed of energy and suspended in time, they also did not see that the once puny inhabitants of your earth would rise one day to unlock us from our crypt. Now that we are free, your race shall become our chariot. We shall use it to burn a trail of fire across the heavens. We shall have our revenge. Three humans, shouting as one, angrily, and with bloodlust. I felt a raw chill run down my spine. Whatever was powerful enough to put down the aliens once, would be powerful enough to put down the aliens again, and this time it would be all the Earth put down with them. Could such a super race exist? I imagine that if it were up to me to do the job, and I had a whole star system infected with the nanoseaborgs, I'd figure out a way to make the home star blow up and sterilize everything out to the Oort cloud. Or worse, though what worse might look like, I willed myself onward, toward the pyramid. Well. You can't have your revenge just yet. I said, there's still one human on Titan with the will to fight back. So if you can afford to leave me to do my worst, by all means, take off. But if you can't afford to leave me, you'll have to come out here and get me before I do something you'll all regret. There was no response that time. Just the telltale clicking of the wireless signal dropping out in my helmet speakers. I had them, but what I'd do about it, I wasn't yet sure. First change I noticed as I hit the bottom of the ramp was that the air was oxygenated. The little atmosphere icon in my FOV was blinking green as I came to a stop, towing the sled full of seismic charges behind me. Made sense. How else could Bedner have coaxed Kendelson into taking his helmet off, though how the pyramid had produced the oxygen, or what controls had been used, still wasn't obvious. I kept my helmet on as I towed the sled over to where the alien corpse lay. Poor bastard. As gruesome as he was, she was. It was. The creature had apparently been only a pawn. For the first time, I looked at the beast with a sense of kinship, as well as pity. Had its world been overrun and absorbed? How many such species had suffered a similar fate? I began to understand that the Nanoseaborgs weren't just vermin. They were about as literally evil as anything mankind had ever encountered. I wasn't a spiritual person. But the fact that they had dismissed God as if he were both real and inconsequential made me cold inside. 
Any race that could wave away God like that. I pushed the sled filled with charges up to the edge of the bowl where the alien host resided. I began to daisy chain the charges together and throw them into the basin, until I'd surrounded the entire alien with a halo of explosives. Thus far I'd been unable to find or make access to the rest of the pyramid, since the area beneath the alien's body was the only place I'd been unable to check. I figure it was time to find out if that was the key. I unwound the detonation line all the way back up the ramp to the waiting rover. A quick 360 scan showed no sign of anyone or anything in my immediate vicinity, so I flipped open the trigger guard on the deadline's control box, took a deep breath, and depressed the big red button. A tiny vibration could be felt through the ice. After a few seconds, black, belching fumes poured from the door. I tapped on my helmet lamps and plunged back down the ramp. It was virtually impossible to see. When I reached the bottom of the ramp, the entire room was clogged with blackness. Like squid ink, I stumbled forward, hoping to see the mild green light of the depression in the floor where the alien was. Suddenly there was nothing underneath me, and I plummeted, screaming. Thankfully, the fall was not a great one. I crashed down onto a pile of loose debris, scrambling to my feet. I scanned about me with my lamps. I guessed I'd fallen about 20 meters. Lethal in Earth gravity. Not so bad in Titans especially with something to cushion me when I hit bottom. I thought I could identify bits and pieces of the alien host's corpse here and there on the floor. It seemed I'd broken through into a huge corridor. I took a few steps forward, and suddenly light sprang on so bright I had to reach up and flip my helmets and used sun visor into place. It was as if the entire ceiling, save for the portion where I'd made the hole, had lit up like a bulb. Now this was more like it. I ran the way I'd first walked until I came to another doorway similar to the one I'd first discovered on the surface the day the Gossamer's descent stage had landed. Only this door was huge, on the order of magnitude of the creature whom I'd obliterated trying to find a path into the deeper recesses of the pyramid. I jumped, pressing the small circle in the center, thus causing the door to slide open. I walked through it, then stopped short just past the threshold, a room as big as a basketball arena. Hundreds upon hundreds of mildly glowing basins, each with an alien cupped at its center. Only they didn't all look the same as the one I'd first seen. A grotesque menagerie of different life forms, all dormant, none of them earthly in origin. I wondered if they had each come from the same home planet. I guess they were merely Nanoseaborg hosts, just like the first alien, and just as Bedner, Majak, and Kendelson had become. There was a large, wide ramp leading down to the room's main floor. I began walking down the ramp, and was pummeled to my knees by a sudden, overwhelming impression of surprise and fear. One thought coalesced in my mind, but from an outside source, he is not part of U.S. He should not be here. That's right, I said, willing myself to my feet. My head hurt and my sense of balance was off, but I realized I'd found what I was searching for, real leverage to use against the enemy while bargaining on behalf of the human race. I shouldn't be here, but I am. Do you hear me? I'm a free man, the last one on Titan, and as long as I've got the power to do something you'll do what? I stopped short. A human figure in a beige robe approached me from across the room. His feet were bare and he was bald, save for a semicircle of white hair that went from the back of one ear around to the back of another. He did not smile, but he also did not frown. I watched as he approached, then stood before me. His expression was passive. Another overwhelming impression. He has awakened the sentinel. I staggered. The sensation of nausea was too much. I was going to vomit in my helmet. The figure, the sentinel, quickly reached out an arm and steadied me. The moment his fingers touched my arm, my nausea vanished and I stood upright. What are you? I asked. That is a question I should be asking you. But now that I have ascertained your being, I need not wonder any longer. I have been given your form according to your thoughts, so that I might communicate with you as something you will understand. Know this. You are trespassing. Young human, go back to where you came from. It is not safe for your kind here. Tell me something I don't know. I said, three of my kind have been infected by the prisoner 2663. Yes, I know. Already, those three infected humans have entered the upper reaches of this vessel what you think of as a pyramid. Prisoner 2663 is devious. 
I have been inactive for a long time. Somehow Prisoner 2663 has managed to mask its more subtle activities for my passive senses. But now that you have made me active again, I shall. What are you? I repeated. The sentinel looked at me with what seemed to be pity. I am unlike anything you can comprehend. A mind. A machine. A soul. A power. I am all of these. And yet I was not so perceptive as to be aware of how much. Prisoner 2663 was able to claw my sight. Very worrisome. Very worrisome indeed. You have to help me. I said. The nanoseaborgs want to claim my planet. They're going to take over Earth. That is to be expected. Prisoner 2663 is just one of many criminal entities in your galaxy. There are convicts far more heinous, if your limited intelligence can imagine it. In the case of Prisoner 2663, the chief crime was the destruction of free will. Free will? I said. Yes, it is the original right of all sentient, sapient species across the universe. And what rights do the Nanoseaborgs have? Prisoner 2663 began as a noble experiment, the blending of biology and technology to create something able to help mortal sapiens transcend what you might call merely human limitations. So what went wrong? What always goes wrong when mortal hands attempt to recreate paradise? Only, Prisoner 2663 was more cunning than most. Once it evaded quarantine and began to spread, it devoured tens of civilizations before it was properly policed, ultimately being confined here, to this moon you call Titan, to be kept in stasis. But why preserve the Nanoseaborgs at all when you yourself say they are such an obvious threat? A threat that you now admit is capable of sneaking past your safeguards? You should wipe them out, destroy them utterly. A just policeman has to have rules, the Sentinel said, looking dour. Those who created me are bound by laws which even they dare not break. Thus I am incapable of breaking them. And if the earth becomes another pawn of this, this prisoner 2663, if human civilization becomes the first in a new list of victims, the sentinel's eyes looked down. He seemed chastened. I regret that neither I nor my makers could see all ends. When prisoner 2663 was confined to this place, humanity was using sticks and stones. Little more. We did not realize that you could be touched by the collective unconscious of Prisoner 2663, much less that your own ambition would take you into space, in your quest for the stars. You were a humble species then. You were not so humble now. Echoing footsteps made me turn and look up to the doorway at the top of the huge ramp. Bedner, Kendelson, and Majak appeared there. I could just barely see their faces. At that distance, they were not amused. As a trio, they spat out something in an entirely alien tongue, and to which the visage of the old man I'd been conversing with reacted by stepping a few paces in front of me, and brandishing his hand in the air. Underneath my three former teammates, the floor suddenly gave way, a concave depression sank instantly, and before they could stand up again, they were frozen in place as a mild, eerie green light shone from the floor of the new basin. There, said the sentinel. The spread of the infection has been halted. Not entirely. I said. We took samples from a creature we found in the pyramid levels above. There is infected blood and tissue aboard my spacecraft. Then it is also infected and should be destroyed. How? I said. Do you have control over the surface too? No. Said the sentinel. My power. And the power of others like me. Exists only in these spaces. Within the pyramids themselves. You must go and do this. And if I can't, if Prisoner 2663 finds a way to get free and take over my body too, the Sentinel considered me. Human, it said, would you consider the safeguarding of your species to be of utmost importance? Yes, I said. And would you be willing to sacrifice yourself if it also meant ensuring that Prisoner 2663 never escapes this place, nor poses a threat to your species, ever again? Yes. The sentinel looked at me, then the slightest of smiles touched his lips. So be it, was all he said before he rushed at me, enveloping me with his arms and kissing my forehead. The gossamer's return module is gone now. She left precisely 25 days after the last known contact with the descent module, which I handily sank to a depth of about 500 meters after melting the ice at the base. The ice has refrozen again. The remnant of prisoner 2663 that Captain Bedner freed has been neutralized. 
along with Captain Bedner herself, who has become a permanent guest of the pyramid over which I now stand watch. If there is any trace of her left within herself, I hope Bedner understands, and my Jack and Kendallson, too. There wasn't any choice, accident or no, deliberate or no. Once they became an active spreader of the contagion, their ultimate fate was sealed. I know, I checked. The Sentinel confirms that no organism so infected by Prisoner 2663 has ever been cured. As for me, I can't yet say for certain what the Sentinel has done to me. In many ways it feels as if he is part of me, or that I am part of him. I've only begun to test the limits of my power. I've spent a lot of time recording my thoughts on all that's happened, so that when men return to Titan they will find the disc. I left it in the rover, which now sits atop the ice, alone because I resank the pyramid to a sufficient depth too, long with all the others, and there are many, the longer I can keep those pyramids out of human reach, the better, maybe by the time mankind is capable of raising and investigating them, mankind will no longer see the need, I can't say I understand the ethos that prevents the sentinel from destroying the nanoseborgs, he seems very old, and very unwilling to dispense information at anything more than a trickle, for my own good. He tells me, but I suppose I've got time, enough to last for centuries, or longer, whatever it takes to keep Earth and the other uninhabited worlds of the Milky Way safe from the Nanoseborgs at least. Prisoner 2663, the shadows of Titan, my charge, they never really sleep, not entirely. Even now, they're calling for you too, can you hear them?